answer these three speakers. So if, you, if anybody has any questions, um, let's go ahead and start. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, one of the big controversies around science during the Deepwater Horizon in the early days of the spill was whether or not scientifically to assess the rate of discharge from the wellhead. And if you recall, they initially said that it was a 5,000 barrel per day spill, 1,000 barrel per day spill, and this was very uncertain. But they also said that an attempt to measure the rate of the spill would interfere with the response operations and therefore should not be done. Has that paradigm changed? Because I think once they did know the rate of the spill, the response effort changed completely. They did the subsea dispersant. Many things were better. Well, in my opinion, you know, the get back to flow information is very important. Uh, and, and it didn't take too long. I mean, remember, right after the spill, it took a month. Yeah, but boy, there was a lot going on in that month. And, and the level of knowledge of getting down there, you, you can't go down and measure it because it's not a little meter you can club in and find out. But you had to send RVs down, you had to find it. Find it. Uh, I, I know there's a, a tendency to not overstate, and I think that was used in here. What if we had gone in and said the first spill, we've got uh, an uncontrolled reservoir that has a discharge potential of a, 100,000 barrels a day or something like that. You know, would that have been better? I don't know. That was an Admiral, Admiral uh, Allen uh, decision. Of course, getting accurate information on flows, it's a lot easier to say than to do. Uh, initially, I think, though, there was, what, three or four flows coming out. It, it, the riser pipe it in a couple of spots. So what was it? Anybody? They, you know, how many, how many discharges were occurring in the three? Three. There were two kinks and, and the other. Yeah. So, but getting it. But you know, to quote another uh, another prominent figure, a difference does it make? Uh, the we had a spill. Now, what the difference would have made is. Would we have gone or could we have done anything quicker than we did? I thought the response was absolutely magnificent. I'm speaking as a citizen of Louisiana. And most people in Louisiana don't know the thousands, thousands of people from NOAA and EPA and all, all forms of government that responded to this bill were 24-7. And, and we just can't thank them enough. So I thought that they, they oh, mobilized about as quickly please, as I have. I'm not denigrating the response no. efforts at all. I'm asking a specific question about is it now formalized that in the event of a deep water spill like this that we would immediately begin assessing the rate because that yes. was a confusion at the beginning. That's my question. Yes. I, so no, I think that we, I agree. The response effort yeah. was magnificent. But is Charlie Henry there? here? Charlie, Charlie was part of the SSC. Gary had an answer, though. Come on. Yes. We can pro project your voice. The answer is yes. 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 Answer is yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I, so I've had some responsibility with developing monitoring plans for the next event that hopefully we never have. And that's one of the first things. So lessons learned from, from that event have been used to develop monitoring plans, and it includes uh, estimating, estimating rates. Including regulatory requirements. Yeah. And another side of that is, and this is a very different side, what if we stop discussing how to do a better analysis of the corpse and take these billions of dollars on prevention? Because we know this was actually a predictable spill. I, I looked at, uh, you know, you do these frequency events and size diagrams, small, a lot of small spills, a few bigger ones and one really massive ones. This is right on the line. It was predictable. So what if we had taken $10 billion, whatever is being paid out, you know? and spent that on prevention. And then we wouldn't have some of these problems, or we would have fewer of them. And I, I think that's a consideration to learn from a spill like this, is that these things are horribly expensive, regardless of why and who pays. They're horribly expensive in terms of the economic issues, they're in, ter in terms of people's time, in terms of the insults to the environment, and there were plenty of things that were damaged from the spill that, you know, last in terms of habitat loss, seagrasses, marshes, loons, sparrows, insects on the marsh, all kinds of things that we're still on point no because they're very subtle sometimes and no but a lot of them are. So what if we'd spent more time and do spend more time on prevention? 
And of course, there are a lot of sociological issues to that as well. And I'm not a sociologist, and I don't, don't want to go there. But I mean, as technically, but I mean, it seems to me that that's part of the conversation out of this. It isn't just how can we better put out a better boom. You know, it isn't just how can we get more ships out there. It's how do we prevent them from happening happening at all. So. Well, I. So, and I don't say anybody was defending saying let's do more spills. I'm just saying that maybe as a society, I'll think about that side of the equation. So I, I would just say that I, so I lead the oil spill response research program for ExxonMobil, and I just that's, that's a fraction of the budget. Right, prevention is the focus. When you first walk in the door as a new employee for a company like ExxonMobil, and I don't think I think the rest of the industry is the same way. Operations integrity is drilled into your head. Every decision you make has to have some sort of risk assessment behind it, and the complexity of that risk assessment depends on the complexity of the decision and the repercussions of the decision. So the amount of effort that goes into prevention is is far greater from the industry than it goes into than into into response. And and then every event is carefully analyzed and lessons learned and regulators and industry does as well. Lessons learned go into making prevention even better. So prevention is a key, is definitely the key focus for everything we do in the, in the oil industry, that's for sure. Is there anybody, any other questions? No? Anybody? Back of the room. You, you want another one? Sure, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> I have another question, which is, if you look at the regional oil spill response plans prior to 2010, they pre featured prominently the booming of shorelines to protect sensitive areas such as marshes and, and bird sites and so forth. Um, has, has, is that still part of the, I mean I look at the, the post-2010 uh, regional plans and, and booming is not such a big factor and I wonder within industry how has the shift been from booming and having hundreds of miles of booms available versus techniques like burning and skimming. How, how has that changed? Has that changed? Well, I think, <clears throat> so booming is used strategically, right? And I think we've always known that it's a strategic option and you're not going to be able to boom a sandy beach, right? If oil hits that boom, the oil's going to go over the beach unless something's done immediately and doing something immediately when you have miles and miles of boom. So I think there's always been an understanding. Um, but that's one of the areas where maybe the science doesn't necessarily get into the into that uh, into that issue, right? And the science would say that maybe it's not you know the resources should be spent on something other than booming off the entire Gulf of Mexico because that's not going to do anything. Certain aspects and diverting oil from certain sensitive areas um, should be should be the strategy and just putting booms up there everywhere. So I'm not sure exactly how the response plans have changed, um, but certainly the uh, there is an understanding within industry, and I think all the responders understand as well that that. Shoreline booming is a, was a political thing during the Deepwater Horizon event, and uh, it has its place. But thinking that you're going to hold back oil from the from the Gulf from the Gulf Coast is is, is just not the way it works. So, and I, I think following up on that, the development of the geographical response plans um, look very closely at areas that can be boomed and areas that where boom will not be effective because of the type of shoreline, because of the wave energy, um, and you know communities have gotten together and made some decisions about priorities, what we can and what we can't protect. Given resources available, these would be the first things that we would protect and other things. And then that becomes a moving decision matrix through the response as it evolves because obviously the oil just doesn't stay in one place. So um, are there still some places that are boomed? Yes. Are there um, are some of those bird areas? Yes. Are some of those sandy beaches? Likely not because they're high energy. But um, focusing those strategies to be most effective so that areas that are very sensitive or difficult to clean are protected as much as possible. Okay, let me throw in on that. Another important part of this strategy is it has to get input from all the players mm -hmm. before an event. Because when an event's going on and you say, this area needs to be protected, where were you when we were developing strategies to protect these areas? So we need inputs, you know, the area committees. I mean, I strongly encourage people to get involved in very crazy and bringing these topics up. Look at the maps and say, hey, why are you protecting this area here? And get the rationale behind it. After the fact, during the during spill, it's too late. It's not going to happen then. Go ahead. If I can add to what Andy's saying, um, we're fortunate in the Gulf, there's been a 
significant amount of effort spent since Pohondo on the area contingency plans, particularly the geographic response strategies. And several of the states have taken upon themselves to make those available digitally. So it turns out that um, I'm pretty sure that most of the Gulf Coast is now available online in a digital area contingency plan environment. So Texas does, Louisiana does, Tennessee, Louisiana has it, and then Florida has taken on the Respond to task of um, doing Florida, Alabama, and Mississippi. So those are available online. Good strategies. Yes. Has, has anything been done to get those strategies out to the people who are doing the work? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
let me get rid of this. How can Sea Grant help bring these people together? So we hosted a workshop similar to this in Texas, and it went really, really well. Um, and so for the next phase of our project, I proposed that we do this in every state, hence we're here in Louisiana. Um, and again, we brought in the folks that you are going to see who are, um, you know, the uh, educators, the academia folks, the oil spill response folks in this local community. Um, we want to try and bridge um, that gap. Talk to each other, you know, figure out faces, who would you talk to, who do you go to. So that is pretty much the whole point of this. So we did this in Texas two years ago. It's coming here to Louisiana now, and hopefully we will continue to go along the Gulf to the Mississippi, Alabama area and the Florida area. And again, it's just for networking and to start that communication on how, who do you talk to, who do I go to, who has the knowledge, how do I get involved, the same, similar thing. So now what um, we are hoping, oh, that's not working. So, so now what we're gonna do is, um, we're gonna break out into groups, and if you came in and you had, um, oh, fabulous, okay. This is just a day of surprises. Um, if you came in, uh, your name tag had a number. Um, <laughs> uh, and if you look, there's easels around the room. Um, one's over here, two's in the back, four's in, oh, two's in the middle, four's in the back, and three is actually going to be outside. There's going to be an, a Sea Grant oil spill team member facilitating these questions. Again, these are questions just to ask. How do we get, uh, get the target, different target audiences, the group, to kind of think and see how we can start getting uh, acting together and facilitating and networking together, fostering these relationships. Um, just for if you did not get a number, um, just to let you know, we did try to keep the Louisiana folks together. That way we get state-specific information. So if you're in Louisiana and you possibly do not have a number, go to group one or two. Um, but then we mixed up all target audiences within each group. So um, Larissa should have put a number hopefully on your name tag. Again, if you didn't get a name tag, um, Louisiana, stay in one and two. Everybody else can go to <laughs> three and four. Um, so we can just go ahead and grab, get up, and go to your specified location. Um, we will be there for about 45 minutes.